Let's get this thing going. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Mark Applier, and I am homeless, kind <laughs> kind of. So basically, I don't have a carpet anymore. I don't have a bed anymore. Uh, none of my electrics have been plugged in apart from this light and my phone charger. None of my like furniture is where it is. It's all messed up, and that's for a good reason because we're we're decorating. So, if if you notice me kind of stumbling around a little, that's because I'm standing on like the f the carpet foundation, like the layer under the carpet. Uh, but yeah, let's go do a revision stream. So what what I'm thinking today is we should just do a big overview of the past couple of days worth of revision. So we've done chemistry, we've done biology, we did a bit of physics. What else have we done? We've done a bit of English and a bit of math. Um, I finally learned how to expand triple brackets. So yeah, well, we're all good guys. So let's start off by doing chemistry. Now, if you guys are watching at home, uh, feel free to join in, maybe pop some stuff in chat. I'm trying to get this camera to be a little bit nicer. There we go. Okay. So chemistry. All right. Here, here's the first question. So during our revision, we have done a lot of exam responses. And the first exam question is going to be... There you go. If you guys are watching at home, it says, how do you make a pure dry crystal? And the crystal that we are making is magnesium sulfur. How do we make that? Okay. Well, let's start doing it. So number one, you want to pour your acid into the beaker. But what is our acid? Well, obviously, magnesium is our, you know, reactive but sulfate, sulfuric acid is our acid. And you're gonna to wanna to pour some in a beaker. Next, to increase the rate of reactions, you need to heat it up. Then you're gonna add some magnesium oxide and then you're gonna add excess. So keep adding magnesium oxide until there is only magnesium oxide left. From there, what you want to do is you want to evaporate. Sorry, no, 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 I'm, I'm, that's wrong. You want to filtrate. See, I, I did that mistake on purpose to catch you. I hate when teachers do that. Just have made you've made a mistake. So you want to filtrate, getting rid of this excess now. Then you want to evap, evaporate. Then you want to leave it to crystallize. And because it's a pure dry crystal, you can pat it down with, I guess, a paper towel. But there you go. That is our exam response for how you would make a pure dry crystal of magnesium sulfur. Of course, you would add maybe some more details. I would personally explain why you would add heat, explain why you would filtrate. So why would I add heat? to increase the rate of reactions because of collision theory, for example. All right, next, neutralization. And we did some of this with Mr. McAdam, so maybe I'll be better at this. So first of all, an acid. What is an acid? It is a substance which disassociates uh, in water to make hydrogen ions. Or, a singular proton, but you don't really need to know that, okay? So anyways, an acid. So a weak acid weak acid partially There you go. Weak acid partially disassociates strong acid fully. 
And remember, the reaction for an acid, which... Sorry, I'll, 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 let me do this. So, our basically here, just remember the, the reaction between an acid and an alkaline will always be a salt plus water. But in this instance, this is just a reaction for water. I think that's everything for neutralization. We have not gone through titration yet in lessons, so maybe expect that tomorrow. All right, I go through titrations, I, I explain everything there. All right, what else have we got? Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, okay, so we've gone through crystallization. We've gone through neutralization. Anything else in chemistry? Oh, electrolysis, of course, okay. So, let's draw a little, our electrolyte there. A positive anode and negative cathode. Remember that acronym, guys? Positive anode, negative cathode. And then remember that if the anode is positive, that means it's for the non-metal. That's negative, which means it is for metal. Okay, so that means that oxygen, it would oxidize and it would reduce. And it needs to be in uh, a aqueous molten form, which because that allows ions to move. You also need to obviously explain that electrolysis breaks down breaks down the ionic lattice. Because remember, it's ionic substances only, ionic compounds only. Electrolysis only applies for ionic um, compounds. Uh, and a good way to remember that it breaks down ionic lattices is anytime Luke Kelly messages me, I break down. Uh, I, I said that <laughs> completely by accident, and obviously I didn't mean it. It's a joke, but it, uh, that, that, that thing, that whole comment just stuck with me. So that is, that is my way of remembering it now. Ionic lattice. Uh, what else do we need to know? I guess bauxite. I, I'm not sure how that would look like. I'm just going to draw kind of a, a rough kind of all looking nice thing. Bauxite is, is aluminum, which I believe, al aluminium, sorry, not the, the American word. Al plus O2. So think about it. O, if, if you guys don't remember what an ore is, it is metal inside of a rock and it needs to be economically viable to extract the metal. But anyways, what do we need from bauxite? Well, we don't really need the oxygen. We need the aluminium. So you put it in something like this, where there's two anodes here, graphite, which means you need to replace them constantly. But basically, the oxygen goes to the anodes, and around here are a bunch of cathodes, or it's just one big cathode, I guess. And that's where the aluminium goes to. And remember, the anodes are made out of graphite. And when it reacts with oxygen, because graphite is carbon, it creates CO2, which wears away at it slowly. And because of that, they need to be replaced constantly. What else do we need to know for that? Oh, cryolite. So the melting point of bauxite is 2000 to, oh, okay, I guess I should also say that it needs to be in a molten solution. But anyways, 2000 degrees, which is fucking, oh, it's fucking warm, right? And in order to make that lower, aka more cheap, you add molten cryolite, which gets it down to a thousand degrees, which is probably a lot cheaper. So there you go. Those are my kind of ramblings about electrolysis. Seriously, guys, the hardest topic I would argue in chemistry is electrolysis 
titration, harbour process, and um, the Chatier's principle. That's kind of it. I would argue those are the three hardest things. Electrolysis, titration, because I don't know about you, but I don't remember shit about that. And harbour process, which two of those are paper one. One of those is paper two, which means paper one is the toughest paper. So I would argue, guys, that if you have even just watched this recap here, where I where I've explained a bunch of the paper one stuff, you're probably helping yourself quite a lot. Now, what else do we need to know for chemistry that I've done on these streams? I know the chemical tests. Can you guys remember them? How do we test? For a hairline, aka a, a group seven. Well, I believe. Hmm. I can't exactly recall the substance. I believe it is silver nitrate. That rings a bell. But to know for sure, and to make sure I'm not spreading misinformation, let me go have a look. at my flashcard pack. Which is somewhere here. Ah, found it. Chemical tests. Alright. It is, it is... Ah, I'm, I'm kind of cheating here by looking at all the other tests. Hair light testing, what is it? Oh, it was silver nitrate, bollocks. So you use silver nitrate to test for it, and then it is chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and each one of those forms a precipitate. But obviously it depends on which one. So for example, chlorine, I think makes a, I think it's a white precipitate, a cream precipitate for bromine, and then a yellow precipitate for iodine. Let me go confirm that. Make sure I'm not, yeah, white, cream, and yellow. Oh, and it also says here sulfate ions can be tested with barium and sulfate ions make a white precipitate. Okay, don't know why that was on that card, but anyways, metal hydroxide testing. Let's go through that as well. Metal hydroxides, I believe you can test with sodium hydroxide. So remember, this is a paper two topic, so you, you won't really need to remember any of these. Let me go check. Um, sodium hydroxide is used because metal ions form an insoluble metal. Okay. I guess if you got like a free mark question about how you would test, you would say that. But anyways, I believe it's aluminium, um, magnesium, and calcium. Copper, iron 2, and iron 3. I believe that aluminium is a white precipitate, but if you add excess, it goes clear. Magnesium and calcium are both white. Copper is blue. Iron 2, I think, is green, and iron 3 is brown. Let me go check that. I was right. Yep, literally every single one of us was right. Okay. So there you go. Those are the two, those are the two bulkiest tests that most people don't get. Flame testing is also one. So if we draw like a, a Bunsen burner there type thing. And oh, look at that, it's a fire. That's the worst drawing I've ever done in my life. But anyways, it's not about the drawing, it's about the chemistry. And in terms of chemistry, you need a wire, like so, and so for example, this is a nichrome wire. 
and you dip it into the metal solution. And what that does is it makes the flame change colour. Uh, so I think potassium is purple or lilac. lilac. I, I'm going to make a couple guesses here. I think sodium is yellow. I think lithium is red. And copper is green. Let me go check if I got those right. Okay, copper was green. Potassium is lilac. Sodium is yellow. Lithium is... Oh my... I, I, I got that right, bloody hell. I, I honestly, I, it's tough to remember the colours for flame tests, but if you know those, those ones, you should be good. What else in terms of chemical tests? How do you test for a hydrogen? Well, if you place it inside of a beaker, it ignite, it produces a squeaky pop, but I'm not sure what you would put in it. Let me go check. Hydrogen, oh, air. Hydrogen ignites in air. If it is present in a test tube, an ignited splint um, would ignite with a squeaky pop. Okay. So, in other words, if it's in a test tube, a lighted... Okay, so if hydrogen gas... If hydrogen gas is in a test tube, like that, and you expose it to fire... It makes a pop. Oxygen, I believe, reignites a glowing splint. Um, so I guess if you place it in something that's making a lot of oxygen gas, that would reignite a half, you know, one up splint. Chlorine, I mean, you could obviously do a hair light test for that, but I believe it also bleaches litmus paper. And carbon dioxide, in order to test for that, if bubbled through lime water, it turns it milky. But I believe there's a more scientific explanation for that. Yep, produces a white precipitate of calcium carbonate. So it turns lime water milky. You could just say white precipitate. And you could call lime water calcium carbonate. But obviously, may, I'm, I assume they would accept when bubbled, through, when bubbled through lime water, it turns it milky. I assume they would accept that. But that's it, guys. That's everything we've gone through in chemistry. And we've done that in less than 20 minutes. And half of that time was me checking if I was right, which I was. So there you go, guys. In 20 minutes, you have learned electrolysis, the hardest subject, I would argue, one of the hardest. You've learned um, chemical tests, which are rarely a pain in the ass to remember. In fact, I dropped eight marks in my previous mock because I forgot every chemical test. That's eight marks. I could have gotten a grade seven from that. I think I got a six or a... I, I don't know really, but I could have gotten higher, obviously. I'm going to go take a break now, so the stream is going to buffer for a little, but I will be back soon, where we'll be going through biology, one thing in physics that I think is important, and we'll, we can also go through English if, if we have time. So I'll catch you guys in just a minute. I'll be right back. Be confused by one fear. Uh, there are plenty of, well, in every one of these streams that I've done, I've got in extensive detail uh, about the topic that I've just got overdone. And guys, listen to this. S seriously, I have made a Google document containing every single thing that I've gone through in these streams. So that means you could use it almost like a little dictionary, for example. So maybe you're like, okay, electrolysis. Uh, let, let, let me have a look. Uh, you go on the Word document, and maybe something there prompts you, like, it reminds me, you have some, uh, like, you see there that I've wrote something about molten, and you think, hang on a minute, is that the ionic breakdown? Uh, and if not, 
I've put stream links to every single one of those topics with exact timestamps. So you'll be able to know exactly what I'm on about. All right, guys? So let's actually get working again. So let's do biology now. Let's start with the blood vessels. All right, so that is meant to be a capillary, one cell thick. Why is it one cell thick? Well, it allows ions to diffuse in and out of the capillaries in order to go to cells. All right, guys. Next, the arteries. Uh, if you get a question in the exam about how arteries are kind of built, you could talk about how they have muscle muscle layers because remember arteries are flowing at high pressure all right high pressure so they need to be able to withstand high pressurized conditions so they have a mus muscle layer and elastic fibers which allows the 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 artery to almost kind of conform in shape a little, all right? And finally, the only thing I've, I've really talked about for veins is obviously vein in, it obviously goes into the heart and our arteries go out, but veins also have valves. That's kind of all you need to know because valves are there to prevent backflow. All right, guys, that is everything that I've done in terms of blood cells. You could get a question in terms of capillaries and how they're adapted in maybe the uh, lungs. And then you could talk about like how oxygen can diffuse in and out, for example. But anyways, let's go talk about, let's go talk about quickly the bacteria because there are a couple of things that I need to talk about with this. Number one, do any of you guys know what these things are called? These little rings. Well, they are rings of DNA, and they are called plasmids. That took me a while to remember. And also, this thing here, this kind of goopity goop, that is literally just a strand of DNA. That's all you really need to know. Oh, and but those kind of tail things are the flagellum, and it allows it to travel around. That's all of the kind of interesting bits of a bacteria, okay? Where's my lid gone? All right, now, kind of a little improv section. I'm gonna talk about one or two things that uh, I did recently in biology that I haven't properly revised. Okay, number one, microscope. I have a microscope and I didn't know a single one of these. So listen up. All right, number one, what equipment do you need when viewing a sample of, let's say, an onion epidermis? You know, like, the, the, you have, like, an onion, and then you get a little slice of it, and you put it under the cell, put it under the microscope to see the cells. What do you need to make that happen? Well, in an exam, they could let you say a variety of things. You could say, obviously, scalpel, used to cut the onion, you could talk about a cover slide, cover slip, sorry. Um, you could just say slide. And there was one more that I don't exactly recall. Oh, iodine. Or, um, I can't remember the proper scientific term for it. Uh, oh, a stain, that's what it's called. Because remember, it, you need a stain cells in order you need to stain cells in order to view them because cells are transparent. So if you get a question in the exam saying, why do you need to stain cells to look at them? You could talk about how most cells are transparent. So staining them allows you to view them under a microscope. Um, also, if you guys get asked a question about what the adjustment knob does, you need to, so what it actually does Guys, what it actually does, is, in fact, oh, my microscope's in my ground. I, mean, I was about to show you guys for real, but no, okay. So this is the stage of a microscope here. Yeah? Here is where you'll put your slide with like your little specimen in, 
and then obviously it kind of I, I, I can't really draw this but you would have like your, your, your viewing things uh, uh, I, I, I don't know guys I, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to highlight the important thing here the important thing is this kind of knob thing here and what this does is it moves the stage up and down. It moves this, this kind of bit here, up and down. But you will get that wrong if you put it in an exam. What it really does, according to the exam, is it increases focus of specimen. That's what you have to say. The adjustment knob increases focus. But if you say that it moves the stage up and down, you get it wrong. Very scummy. Okay, guys, I'm looking through a microscope. I can't see anything. Why is that? There's many reasons why. Your microscope isn't on. You might be looking at an air bubble. Or your slide. <laughs> True. Blind. Or your slide is out of range. Or... You haven't clicked into place the lens, the scope. Uh, any one of those would work. That is a serious question we had in our last mocks, and nobody got it. So remember those. Guys, so I, I'll be totally real. In biology, state the fucking obvious. And I swore there to emphasize it. State the obvious. Okay, question we had in our biology exam. Um, a potential hazard is the scalpel. Why? People were like, oh, uh, contamination could occur. No, it could cut you. Because it's a fucking scalpel. It cuts things. And nobody got it. Nobody got that in the exam. You also had to talk about why. Why? Um, like, how would, how would you prevent this danger? How would you prevent the scalpel from cutting you? And in the exam, you would have gotten it for literally saying, handle with caution. But, like, that, that's so obvious, isn't it? Like, seriously, that is the most obvious thing. Of course you would handle it with caution. But nobody got it in the exam because they were overthinking it. But they were, I, I, I even remember thinking, like, wh what would you do? Like, what, what, what would you do? W would you, like, wear gloves? No. Just literally just handle it with caution. So, yeah, if you get a question in a biology exam that seems a little bit too complex, think about it obviously. Okay? Why do arteries have elastic fibres? It's not so that you can do bloody space magic. It's because of the high pressures. It's so that if blood goes in, it can stretch. Literally state the obvious in biology. Nine times out of ten, that will be what, how, you know, the marks you get. Let's also talk quickly about, let's say we have 2.7 centimetres. Okay. How will we get back to millimetres? Times it by ten. 27 millimeters. How will we get back to micrometers? Times it by a thousand. Barely anybody remembers that. But you could be missing out on five marks in an exam because of that that I just taught you, okay? So that's it in terms of biology, I think. I mean, what else have we gone through in biology? We went through... We went through blood vessels. Can any of you guys remember? Do, have any of you guys actually been paying attention to these? If so, what, what else have we done in biology? I've honestly barely slept, so you can blame me for, for forgetting. But I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think that's all we kind of went through, really. We did a tiny bit on... Oh, mitosis. Uh, set the paper thing. Uh, set the paper thing you got 
he put on top of a bunch of burn it on fire. What? What, what does that mean? Set the paper thing you put on top of a bunch of burn it on fire. You mean the... Gauze? I don't even know what you call it. But anyways, mitosis. Mitosis. This is what it is. I'll just draw a diagram of it, okay? This is our beautiful circle. Uh, yeah. Oh, so like the little thing that looks like a grill? I haven't gone through that in one of these, but okay. Uh, so anyways, in the nucleus, your chromosomes replicate. That is step one. Number two. The nuclear membrane, um, I can't remember the word, dissolves? Nuclear membrane. The nuclear membrane does something, it breaks apart. Okay, I'll try to find the actual word for that. You can find it on the document actually, but the word document that I've sent to anyone who watches these streams, you can find the exact word for that. If one of you can tell me what it is, I will, I will be very happy. All right, anyways, the nuclear membrane breaks down. These chromosomes line up in the middle. The nucleus then divides. All right. Then spindle fibers pull each, um, can't really remember the, the terminology, pull each pair of chromosomes to either side of the cell. And then, the whole cell replicates. The cytoplasm, the cell membrane, everything replicates. So now you have um, two identical daughter cells. And that's that. So there, that is everything that I've gone through in biology. Everything. And if you were watching 20 minutes ago, uh, I also just went through everything that I did in chemistry. All right, let's move on to physics. If you're not in triple science or you're not taking a higher paper, don't pay attention here. All right. So, how would we test the strength of an electromagnet? Well, number one, you would wrap your electromagnet with an insulating wire in a coil. Then you would attach two clips to it and attach those to a power supply. So remember the coil allows, um, it kind of, I, I, I can't remember the exact reason why, but coil would allow magnetic, it would allow electrons to move closer together, I think, which is what makes it magnetic. Um, anyways, so you would attach it to the power box, then you would drop some paper clips on there. You would use a clamp stand to stand the magnet up, so for example if it's like a nail. You would see how many it picks up. Then you would record your data in a table, and then, when, and then in order to test the strength, you would increase the potential difference in the power supply. See how many more it picks up. Then you would plot it in a graph. And in order to make sure that everything is safe, you would keep the wires, you would keep the power on for as little time as possible in order to prevent burns from the wire, from the wire heating. That is a six mark question in an exam. And I only scored three out of six of it last time. But now I know what to talk about, all right? So there you go, that is science done. If you don't like science, you can click back on now because we're done with science. I've just talked about some of the most top tier stuff there that like most people don't understand. And if you guys still don't understand it, go over and watch a previous stream. So that's what they're, they're public for. Let's go quickly do an expanding triple brackets question because I missed out on so many marks in, in my box because this question, um, because this question, I, I didn't know how to do. So the method is simple. All right, look, 
x times x squared is x cubed. x times 5 is 5x. Minus 8 times x squared is literally minus 8x squared. Algebra, this form of algebra, anybody could do it. Seriously, it is that easy. State the obvious. What's minus 8 times 5? It's going to be minus 5, isn't it? Then you pop it all into a grid like this. X and minus 2. All right, what's X times X cubed? It's obviously going to be X to the power of 4. What's 5X times X? It's obviously going to be 5X squared. What is X times minus 8X cubed? Minus 8, oh sorry, minus 8X squared would be minus 8X cubed. Minus 40 times X is minus 40X. I can't, I, if you guys don't understand this, I didn't for months and it's finally clicked. So if it hasn't clicked for you guys yet, practice questions until you kind of can learn how to do it. The biggest problem with me for it was I was under the impression that like, if I multiplied minus eight X squared by X, I would get nine minus nine X squared. But no, X's stick with X's, numbers stick with numbers. That would be minus two X cubed. That would be minus 10 X. That would be, that would be positive 16 X squared. And that would be 80. Now for the really fun bit, I, I love this part because it's so, so satisfying. You collect your terms. So anything with an X squared in, we can add together. 11 X squared. And we can cross these out. Anything with an X cubed in, we can collect. Minus 10 X cubed. Anything with a number and then X, we can collect. So that would be minus 50 X. Anything with a number in, we can collect, 80. And anything with x to the power of 4 in, we can collect. So our finished result right there is x to the power of 4, take away 10x cubed plus 11x squared minus 50x plus 80. Yup, it is a long-winded question, but seriously, these click for me every time now, and I can do them within like maybe a minute and a half before it took me ages to even be able to do this bit. If you guys don't understand how to expand triple brackets, please revise them because expanding appears in all forms of algebra. It appears in the tough six markers. It appears in the easy free markers. So just make sure you know how to expand. Not even triple brackets, just know how to expand double brackets. Do you know that x times x squared is x cubed? All right. We are almost done, guys, with our recap of absolutely everything. And this is only week one. We still have 15 days of revision. Think about it. We have gotten so much done in day one. Almost 45 minutes worth of content. So think about what we could get done in the next 15 days. I'm going to also be doing history, RE, and not media because no one cares. But I'm going to be doing RE revision at some point, And I'm going to be doing history re revision quite often as we get closer to the days. But for now... Um, I'm pretty happy. Oh, here's something. Guys, here is something. Like, seriously, I know I tell you guys to pay attention. Please, for the love of God, pay attention to this bit. Because you could get a horrendous six marker in math paper one that could end your life. All right? Because, guys, math paper one is not... It is not calculator. So what if I got a question like this? Sin 45. 
How the hell would I do this? What's Sim 45? What, 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 how, what would I do? I can't get a calculator, it's done loud. What would you actually do, guys? Do any of you know? Well, you would do the hand trick. <laughs> I'm gonna actually draw my hand for this. This is I, I, I'm gonna kind of exaggerate it a little here. Cause I, oh, that looks evil. Okay, but guys, use your, Jesus Christ. No, I, okay, okay. If you wanna get expelled, do it that way, but Guys, and I, I mean, this isn't like a meme. Seriously, pay attention here. Because if you get this in an exam, and you're there thinking, shit, what do I do? You could literally drop a whole grade because of this. So, the hand, what does it symbolize? Your thumb, or your first finger, is 15. Your second finger is 30. Third finger is 45. Second finger, I mean... Fourth finger is 60, and that is 90. Actually, I think this is meant to be zero. Just gonna put it as zero. So, zero, 30, 45, 60, 90. Now the way it works is for sin, let's say sin 45, it is the number of fingers below that number squared. So look, two, look, one, two numbers below our chosen number. So it will be the square root of two divided by two. If we're doing cosine of let's say cosine of 30, it's a little different. If we pick 30, it is the number of numbers above your chosen number. So in this instance, 45, 60, 90. So that will be the square root of 3 over 2. Now, I know my explanation there might have seemed a bit weird. Like, oh, where have you gotten these numbers from? How did you know a square root? Google hand trick sin cos tan or um, trigonometry hand trick. I swear to God. You learn it for five minutes, you will never have to use it apart from math paper one, and it could save you so many marks. Sin zero, I guess that would literally be the square root of zero over two. Oh, nothing. Because zero, there's no number below that. If you were doing cos zero, I assume that would be square root of four over two or one. Actually, hang on, yeah. Perfect example, man. Cos of zero, you would do, I mean, zero, okay, let, let, let's just plot it out. Zero, 30, 45, 60, 90. We have zero. How many numbers are above zero? Four, so it would be the square root of four, over two, but look at this. The square root of four is two. Two divided by two is one. There you go, that could be a two mark question in your exam. And two marks might not seem like much, but that is a big amount. Uh, where is tan? Okay, tan, please don't quote me on this because that's the only kind of annoying one. I think it's Bottom over top. So if it said tan 30, but again, please don't quote me on this. It might be top over bottom. I honestly cannot remember because it doesn't come up too much. But anyways, let's say it was tan 30. It would be the square root of one over the square root of three. It might be the other way around though. Can't remember, but that's but the gist of it. Bottom over top. Oh, bottom over square root of top. But again, if you guys don't know that, Google it. Again, I'm gonna actually after this, quickly check what the tan hand rule is to make sure I, I've explained that right. But there you go, guys. 
That is everything that I, I'm talking about in today's stream. And look at that. We've added some bonus content to what we've, what we've done, haven't we? We've done um, a flipping, uh, I guess, microscope. Microscopy in terms of biology. And we've just done there, trig without calculator. That is two whole things there that you have learned in the span of maybe 45 minutes. Plus, we just went through every single other topic from all the other streams. I have put four streams worth of knowledge into one right there. And remember, we got 15 days left of this guy. So there you go. If this stream helps you out in any way, be sure to like it. I'm doing one of these every single day until GCSEs. And even then, I might do some one-off streams where we go through the papers, uh, things like that, where you guys tell me what you got. You know, we, we kind of debated out a little. But honestly, guys, that was a lot of fun. Keep the questions coming, guys. If you haven't been invited to the Google Doc, let me know and I'll invite you to it. The Google Doc contains all the information that I've gone through in these streams, as well as some exam questions if you want to practice, uh, and also just timestamps for where I've gone through them in stream. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. I'm probably gonna, what time is it? Almost nine. I'm probably gonna go in a call with Luke now. All my electrics have been plugged, so I was going to play Terraria, but I don't even know if I'll have the chance. But yeah, there you go, guys. Thank you so much for watching, as always. Um, be sure to, you know, be sure to take these streams seriously, guys. Because again, remember, this is... Um, we are going to be doing some... Good provision. We, we have been doing some good provision, guys. Seriously. Um, and if you don't think so, literally, look at my ability there. I was able, in that chemistry section, I literally immersed myself because of how much I remembered. So if you, if you don't believe that these streams are helping you, then they might not be helping you so much, but they are certainly helping some people. Uh, and remember, guys, a good way, the best way I find for a vision is literally past papers, past questions. But if you don't know the content, past papers won't help you. You need to know the content, and that's what these streams are here for. You need to learn the content, guys. Seriously. The content is just as important as questions. Anyways, I am now heading off. I'll catch you guys tomorrow.